He nicknamed Warthog, Tank Killer, Beast, and who knows what else, became iconic thanks to the large and powerful GEU-8 Avenger autocannon. The 7-barrel 30mm weapon is the most powerful autocannon ever built in any single crew tactical aircraft. There is no tank that can resist its firepower. All hail the mighty gun. Before we pick the truth from the legend, I would like to point out that most of the video is about the service and role of the A-10 during the Cold War and large-scale conventional warfare. The low-intensity counterinsurgency or in short coin environment is a totally different thing. One of the most common comments about the Avenger, is that any tank can be destroyed without issues thanks to its PGU-14 BMO which contains a depleted uranium penetrator. While the reality is very different from this. Yes, the A-10A and the GAU-8 is a very potent weapon even in conventional warfare but its fame partially lacks foundation. To judge the real anti-tank capability of the Avenger we must at least examine the results of two tests against different types of tanks. The first test happened in 1978 using T-62 tanks as targets. Yes, the US managed to acquire two Soviet main battle tanks during the Cold War. Another test was conducted in 1979 using old American M-47 tanks. Luckily, today the armor layout of both tanks is known. This knowledge makes it possible to evaluate the armor-piercing capability of the Avenger. Let's start with the second mentioned case. The aim of the trial was to examine the effectiveness of a single A-10 against a 10-tank size tank company using only the GAU-8. The test was executed by the followings. The pilot performed 10 attack runs, only one against each target. The targets were stationary. The visibility conditions were perfect. And of course, there was zero anti-aircraft activity. The Avenger was fired an average at 4 degrees dive. The maximal dive angle was 6 degrees, and the minimal was 3. The average firing distance was only 750 meters. The maximal firing distance was 810 meters, and the minimal 660. The A-10 always attacked the M-47 tanks from their right side. In total 174 shots were fired, the average burst length was 0.6 seconds. 86 rounds directly hit the targets and 4 more hits were ricochet. From these 90 hits only 30 penetrated the armor, only one third of the hits. Out of the 10 targets, 3 were destroyed. 4 were immobilized, 2 of these 4 lost their firepower. 1 suffered minor damage, it had very slight loss of mobility and firepower. Two targets re remain totally combat capable with insignificant damage. At first glance the Avenger gun demonstrates decent firepower and accuracy, but there are many issues with the test. These were also mentioned in the original report. First of all, the kill rate. Even a side kill against an old M47 could not be guaranteed. In two cases at least 10 rounds hit the target with minimal effect. Secondly, during the test nobody fired anything on the plane. The combat stress as a factor simply cannot be accounted for. This is a very important factor because the aiming with the Avenger is dependent on the manual skills and the naked eye of the pilot. The heads-up display just provides assistance to the aiming as the pilot controls the plane. It is hard to imagine that when anti-aircraft guns firing on the plane or a missile is launched, that the aim could be so good and accurate as seen during the test. The targets were stationary and the visibility was perfect. An artificial smoke generation was not applied and the weather was perfectly clear. A real combat environment is totally different. The firing distance was also was incredibly short at only 750 meters. This meant that the A-10 flew deep into the engagement zone of every air defense unit. The slow speed of the plane gives air defense plenty of time to spot, identify and engage the Warthog. Before we move on the analysis of the autocannon, we have to understand composition of the air defense which would hunt the Hog. Let's start with just the units up to the regiment level the ground-based air defense. Even considering the shortest range the SU-23-4 Shilka self-propelled anti-aircraft gun, the A-10 would spend too much time within the 750-meter firing distance. The Shilka was effective against such large planes up to 2.5 km distance and 1,500-meter altitude. Besides the air defense guns, we must consider the short-range surface-to-air missile systems. These could be the Strela-1M NATO Code SA-9, and the Strela-10M NATO Code SA-13, short-range self-propelled air defense vehicles. 
These were effective about up to 4 to 5 kilometers distance at a 3,500 meter altitude. The missiles used by the SA-9 had a photo contrast detector at the visible part of the spectrum. In those years, due to the low sensitivity of infrared detectors, locking on to incoming targets was impossible. Shooting at the enemy aircraft was possible only at a tail aspect situation, mainly after it performed at least one pass. So these systems did not have all aspect engagement capability. The missile used by the SA-13 had selectable guidance. It could select the same photo contrast as the SA-9, and also against receding targets infrared guidance. Before the aiming, a mode had to be selected. The infrared channel that required prior cooling, could be used against receding targets, and was effective against natural optical interference. At last, we can't forget about the manned portable air defense systems, or in short, manpads. The first among these were the Strela 2M, NATO code SA-7. Against an A-10, it could be used up to 2.5 kilometers at 1,200 meter in altitude. The SA-7 similarly lacked the all-aspect capability. The engagement zones of the mentioned system show where the hit is possible, and where the intercept would happen. The launch distance against receding targets is smaller, and against incoming targets is higher. Of course, performing a lock against incoming targets is not an easy thing to do. The most dangerous short-range SAM was the OSA KM, NATO code SA-8. This could engage targets at up to 10.3 kilometers at 4,500 meter altitude. While Strelas used infrared guidance, the OSA used radar-guided missiles. The missile had very good maneuverability. Even at the edge of engagement zone, and at low altitude, it could perform a 25G turn. The AKM variant of the SA-8 was relatively abundant. The Soviet first echelon units already had them in the late 70s. The export of OSA AKM into Warsaw Pact countries started in 1980. Not every member country acquired the OSA and of those that did receive them, only the very few and best divisions got them. In the Warsaw Pact in the late 70s the SA-7 and SA-9 were used by all first echelon units except in Czechoslovakia. At this same time the Soviet units already adopted the Strela-3, NATO code SA-14, and the SA-13. There were higher level and longer range SAM units in the army, but for simplicity they will not be part of the analysis at this time. We can see on this diagram, the engagement envelope of the mentioned systems. Now we can understand the impact of the 600 to 800 meter firing range. In combat the A-10 would be well within the engagement zone of every system that generally follows a troops from a short distance behind. A nominal first-line Soviet motorized rifle battalion generally had a pair of SA-9s or SA-13s, a pair of Shilka, eight manpad launchers, and a pair of OSA KM. Therefore, keeping a larger distance from the target is highly advisable but this has effect on aiming accuracy and dispersion of the cannon. Let's keep that in mind. Now let's check what defense the A-10 had against these listed threats. Near the wingtip of the hog, four dispenser cartridges were built in on each wing, and four at rear part of each rear landing gear bay. In total the A-10 had 16 cartridges. Each cartridge can be loaded with 31-inch size flare decoy so in theory the total loadout could be 480 charges. Even if some of the charges were loaded with chaff, this was an incredible number of decoys, especially in the late 70s. For comparison the F-16A had only two cartridges and the very large F-15 had eight. F-16C variants later got two extra cartridges. How effective could be the flares against the missiles of 70s? Well, as a reference we have only limited sources. Maybe it is best that we observe some examples from Operation Desert Storm in 1991. About a half dozen or dozen flares launched in the right moment confused the seekers of AIM-9M missiles almost every time. In comparison the AIM-9 Mike variant was far more advanced than the missiles of the SA-9 or SA-13, or any manpads before the IGLA, NATO code SA-18. Even jets like the MiG-25 could defeat an AIM-9M launched at its rear aspect. The AIM-9 seekers could be defeated even with full afterburners going. Considering this, we can safely assume that flares used in a massive scale would make a very hard target of the A-10 in the late 70s for any infrared or electro-optical guided missile. The HOG has enough flare charges to launch them preemptively as a precaution without waiting for a SAM launch detection. The deployment of flares combined with the low infrared signature engines, made the Warthog relatively safe for a few attack runs. The flares not only could break the lock of launched missiles, but it could block even proper aiming. The flares could block the signature of the real target, giving the A-10 a chance to leave the engagement zone before the SAM launch could even happen. The A-10 could carry a jamming pod to defeat radar-guided missiles. The effectiveness of the electronic countermeasure is complex thing which can be topic for another time. 
Therefore, let's say that it was possible to use this equipment if it were available. The pod could be a LQ-119 or a LQ-131. Now that we know the threat, hopefully it is clear why a more realistic performance test would be done at 1200 to 1400 meters firing distance. This test could demonstrate operating at the edge of the engagement zone of anti-aircraft guns and the oldest manpad, the SA-7. These SAM units that usually follow the troops they cover. In this test the A-10 would be at increased range for better survivability. However, the dispersion of the firearms in terms of dispersion radius increases with distance. This means that even with perfect targeting, which of course does not exist, fewer rounds hit the target because they cover a larger area. In the region of 800 to 1300 meter firing distance, the dispersion radius increases only linearly with distance. At a range of 1300 meters, the area covered by the rounds is roughly three times that of 750 meters. The radius is about 73% bigger which means a dispersion area would be three times larger. Another factor of the distribution of the shots inside the total dispersion area, which is far from being linear along the radius. This is the Rayleigh distribution which is true for all firearms. The dispersion from the center outwards increases for a while then decreases. For this reason, the proportion of projectiles in the target is not a third, but rather is about a quarter compared to the smaller range. Due to the higher proportion of missed rounds, a much longer burst is required to achieve the same number hits that were acquired at a shorter distance. From 1300 meters, it would take about a 2 seconds burst or even longer to get a considerable amount of hits on a tank size target. This is not a vague assumption. We can see such long burst in videos, where the effect of dispersion on the hit rate is clearly visible. The 10 strafes in the test were completely unrealistic. The reality is fewer attacks using long bursts against one or two targets. Even considering the two second long burst, the hog has plenty of ammunition to destroy many targets. The maximum rate of fire of the Avenger gun is 4,200 rounds per minute, which is nominally 70 shots fired per second. Due to the spin-up time of the cannon, the average rate of fire is lower for short bursts. If we consider about 2 seconds long burst this effect is almost insignificant on the average rate of fire. The A-10 carries a maximum amount of 1,170 rounds. The total ammo is enough to engage at least a half a dozen targets with bursts of more than 2 seconds. Therefore, the ammo capacity does not restrict the killing power of the plane even from the longer distance. In fact, the result of the tests against M47 inadvertently shows the effect of distance likely because of an aiming error. In the case of the two undamaged tanks the hit ratio was very low. They were only hit by three or four rounds that were unlucky hits which did not find a weak spot in the armor. In one case a tank took 11 hits and none of them penetrated the armor. More fired rounds means a higher chance to score more hits. When the armor of the target and the armor piercing capability of the cannon are so close, more hits is the key to destroy the target. Here comes the next issue, the armor thickness of the targets. Not only the accuracy, but the penetration of the rounds is also less as the distance increases. As the velocity of the projectile decreases so does its armor piercing capability. The Avenger with the PGU-14 ammo can penetrate a 69mm thick rolled homogeneous steel armor at 600m considering a 30 degree tilted armor plate. At 1000 meters the penetration is 59 millimeters, and at 1200 meters it is 55 millimeters. During the test the average engagement distance was 600 to 800 meters, therefore the penetration value was around 64 to 69 millimeters. In the case of perpendicular impact, zero degree tilting, these values are 15% higher, which means about 73 and 79 millimeters armor piercing capability. It is time to evaluate the test against the M47. The armor protection of this US tank, to put it mildly, was not a good representative compared to the tanks commonly used by the Warsaw Pact. The armor thickness of the M47 was far lower than the T55 and T62 tanks which were already a second line tank in the Soviet Union even in the mid 70s. At this time, exports of the T72 M1 tank to the Warsaw Pact countries had already begun in small quantities. Its armor protection roughly corresponded to the Soviet version of the T-72 Alpha variant. Since data is not available about the M-47 armor layout we use the subsequent M-48 Patton tank as an example. The thickness of the turret armor was between 65 and 115 mm slope between 28 to 33 degrees. This tilt was reduced by only 3 to 6 degrees thanks to the dive angle of the A-10. The protection of the turret is not symmetrical but the A-10 fired from the right every time during the test. 
This was the armor which the Avenger could not penetrate twice though the range was less than 800 meters. This predicts the effectiveness of the cannon against an even more protected, and more modern designed Soviet main battle tanks. In contrast, the side armor of the Soviet T-55 tank turret was 115 to 160 mm thick and on most of this area the armor was tilted more than 30 degrees. Based on the test results and the armor thickness, it is highly unlikely the cannon would achieve any penetration even from a very short distance. It is not surprising that the T-62 and the best Soviet tank, the first version of the T-64 family, also had thicker armor than the then obsolete M-47 American tank. Even the back area of the turret reached a 55 to 66 mm in thickness although the armor was not tilted there. The most vulnerable part of the tower was below the turret ring but the armor of the hull and the wheels of the track also provide some protection. This is not shown in the drawing. Therefore, the armor is thicker than what the figure shows. It can be stated with sufficient confidence that the side armor of T-55 and T-62 could be penetrated by Avengers anti-tank ammunition, but only from very close and only in a small area. Still, this would require a bit of luck. The chance of the penetration is low because the rounds must find a weak spot on the armor. Realistically a crew inside even a T-55 would likely be safe at a distance of 1000 meters unless the A-10 attack from the rear. The gun could damage the track, wheels, or any item on the turret like the machine gun, but penetrating the turret or hull armor would be close to impossible even if the A-10 attack from the side. Penetration through the front armor is fairy tale. There is a good reason why tanks have 100mm plus caliber guns and not 30mm Avenger cannons. The vulnerable rear of the tank provides the A-10 with the only realistic target. Actually scoring some hits here is easier said than done. The trajectory of the attacking A-10 in this case, would put it in range of the nearby army air defense units that almost always take the rear of a formation. The common misconception that the A-10 can destroy tanks using the gun through the thin top armor, is also not true. Yes, that top armor is only 33 to 55 mm thick for the three mentioned Soviet tanks. However, keep in mind that firing in a 3 to 6 degree dive means such a shallow angle that the effective armor thickness would be way above 100 mm. Moreover, due to the impact angle the rounds would probably just slide off the armor. Some people may imagine using the Avenger in a very steep 30 to 45 degrees dive to avoid the shallow firing angle but this would be also unrealistic. First the target would be below the cockpit so the pilot simply can't see that when starts the diving. Therefore, the aim would be quite hard. Because of the dive and speed, the pull-up maneuver also demands at least a few hundred meters of altitude so the firing range would be higher than in shallow approach. And lastly, the hog would start the attack pass at least 1,500 meters or even higher. What do Soviet air defense crews call a large plane that is slower than 500 kilometers per hour and comes in so high? A practice target. Summarizing so far, even in the late 70s, the Avenger was able to show sufficient firepower only against second-line Soviet tanks. But even against these the penetration was possible only from close range from the side or preferably from behind the tanks. To achieve penetration against the T-72A and its export variant would essentially only have been possible with great luck from the side and back even if the fire range was less than 500 meters. The armor of the best Soviet tank versions of the late 70s and 80s were immune to Avenger except from rear impacts. Tanks are in this category where the T-64A and B, T-80A and B and T-72B variants. Now it is time to examine the result of the test against the Soviet T-62 tanks. It was not an easy task to obtain them in the 70s so only two T-62s were available. Because of this, only seven passes were possible and each new pass meant firing on an already damaged tank. The firing angle was even more shallow than the angle used against the M47S. It was between 1.7 and 4.4 degrees. The pilots open fire at slant ranges between 2,800 and 4,400 feet, 850 and 1,350 meters, and cease fire at ranges between 1,600 and 3,050 feet, 500 and 900 meters. The burst lengths varied from 120 to 165 rounds which meant about 1.9 to 2.5 second bursts. These values are far more similar to a real combat situation than the tests conducted against the US-made tanks. The impact on hit ratio due to the longer firing range is clearly visible. Except one pass the hit ratio generally was between 6 to 18 percent. During the test against the M47S, which was about half distance, was generally between 42 to 73 percent. From the seven passes. One missed the target not a single round hit it. 
Three were kills, only problem all of them were achieved form the rear or rear right directions. In one case, even from attacking the rear, only mobility and firepower kill was achieved. When the hog fired from the side only mobility loss and partial firepower reduction was found. On the front armor penetration was not achieved. As we can see, the possibility of destroying even an old T-62, was only likely from the rear or partially rear. In one case the T-62 survived 19 hits even from a rear attack. So that is it? Was the A-10 a worthless piece of junk? Was it the useless toy of the Star-Spangled Banner Armed Forces? No, it was not useless, not at all. Only its role and targets are misunderstood by the masses. No matter how spectacular and powerful the tanks are, they are only a fraction of military vehicles in any army in the world. This is true even if we only consider combat vehicles. The infantry fighting vehicles, armored personal carriers, self-propelled artillery and mortars, tracked or wheeled platforms of armor-piercing missiles are much more numerous. Considering a single regiment or division about there are 6 to 10 times more combat vehicles than tanks. In addition, there are trucks and tank trucks and other logistics and engineering units that are often not armored at all or have only very thin armor. Against these the firepower of the Avenger gun is more than enough. Regardless the distance and attack direction. These units are all well within the capability of the gun. If the pilot's aiming was able to achieve at least some hits, their fate was quite certain. Against such target the Avenger had 360 degree killing capability even from long range. Using the point of view of 70s, there were abundant targets for the A-10 where precision guided missile and a complex targeting systems were not needed. Of course, the counteractions and activity of the Army Air Defense had to be dealt with. The A-10 was designed to be a weapon of world war therefore expected loss rate was not as today's standard even if we exclude the possibility of a nuclear war. Likely the designers assumed that the radar-guided SAMs can be suppressed by the seed planes like the F-4G. The A-10 would approach its target at very low altitude, therefore the longest range SAM, the SA-4, likely couldn't detect and track them long enough to guide a missile to it. The huge quantity of flares could deal with the infrared and photocontrast guided missiles. Against the Shilka and AAA, the plane would try to keep distance and stay 1,200 meters away or even farther for use of the Avenger. This leads to the conclusion that SA-8 and the SA-6 were the highest threat to the A-10. So far, we have not spoken about the SA-6, but it is good to know about this system. This radar-guided short-range air defense system has about 20 kilometers range. The equipment and organization of the Army Air Defense will be explained in detail in a different video series. Understanding the role of the Air Force and close air support is another element to consider in the importance of the A-10. The US Air Force is a support branch of the whole armed force itself. Anybody with sense can't expect that the air power alone can deal with the total force of any army, especially with its hardest units, the tanks. Air support often means changing the balance of an ongoing battle. It helps to provide very quick and flexible aid and firepower where the friendly forces can't handle the situation alone. But to change the force ratio between sides does not necessarily mean to destroy the tanks. If just a part of opponent's forces lose their fighting capability temporarily, it can mean a lot. In the middle of a combat situation, losing mobility or firepower means losing the capability to attack. While the tank may be repairable and later possibly sent back into combat, for a short time such a badly damaged tank in ongoing combat is almost as good as a destroyed target. The gun barrel, the optics, the wheels and tracks can't be armored. The Avenger is capable enough to damage in these vulnerable parts. But in most cases, the crew of the tank would be quite safe in modern tanks. Modern meaning any first-line Soviet main battle tanks from the second half of 70s. In short, the Avenger is a really powerful cannon, but it is anything but a tank-killing wonder weapon, regardless of what many people believe. The overestimation of it, likely comes from the role of the A-10 in counterinsurgency warfare and low-intensity combat environment. In these regions the A-10 could use the gun literally without any real threat in the last 20 years. It could provide close air support to troops when it was not possible to use guided bombs and missiles because of their excessive destructive power. Regardless this high merit to the value of the Avenger on a modern battlefield is literally non-existent. The A-10 never faced with an advanced air defense system. The air defense of Iraq during the Desert Storm was far from the best first-line Soviet units in the mid-80s. In fact, it was not even par with late 70s of the Warsaw Pact in general. So, when the A-10A entered service in the late 70s it had a reasonably good chance to survive over the battlefield. 
But since the late 70s many things changed. In the mid-80s the IGLA manpad, NATO code SA-18, appeared. Its dual-band seeker was a totally different thing in terms of jamming resistance. In theory against a dual-band seeker the flare simply does not work. Even if we assume that perfect system does not exist, the infrared counter-countermeasures capability of the IGLA was a totally different thing compared to the very basic older IR seekers. Until the second part of the 80s all Soviet first-line units were equipped with the OSA AKM, SA-8. This system was also adopted by most minor Warsaw Pact countries. The slow A-10 simply could not outmaneuver the SA-8 like it could the MANPAD or infrared-guided Shorad missiles. Since the end of the Cold War, many new Russian Army short-range air defense systems have been exported. Even if we just focus on the short-range category, the SA-13 was replaced by the Tunguska, NATO code SA-19, with almost double engagement zone compared to its predecessor. The successor of the OSA AKM is the Tor M1, NATO code SA-15, which can guide missiles simultaneously to two separate targets. The Tor M2 can attack four targets at the same time. They are even capable of self-defense against incoming anti-radiation missiles as long as they are in the scan zone of the fire control radar. The Tor system have slightly larger engagement zone than the OSA AKM had. Considering these changes even against a 30-year-old Soviet-like air defense using the gun is not a wise thing. It rather can be called suicidal. Reaching this point likely emerges the question, if the Avenger is not the tank-busting tool of the Warthog then what is? The answer is Maverick. No, it is not Tom Cruise from the Top Gun movie, but rather the different variants of the AGM-65 missile. In the late 70s this meant the television-guided AGM-65 A and B, and from the mid-80s the infrared imaging D variant. The A, B and the D variants of the Maverick were all self-guided missiles. After the lock and launch, the A-10 could break and turn away from the threat. Thanks to this feature it could be kept much larger distance from the air defense compared cases when the Hog used the gun, bombs or unguided rockets. Although the AGM-65 could fly farther than 10 kilometers from 2,000 to 3,000 meters altitude, Limitations of the seeker reduce the practical launch range to about 5 kilometers or even less. The type of the targets could hardly be identified on the TV screen because of the low resolution. Therefore instructions from the ground was vital in successfully engaging the right target. In the mid-80s the laser-guided Maverick was developed, this was the E variant, it was not used on the A-10 because the plane was not able to self-designate targets. It could only detect an external laser designation using the PAVE Penny equipment which was under the nose of the HOG. During Desert Storm the AGM-65D was used in large scale by the A-10s. The usefulness of the AGM-65D was confirmed by the commander of the Coalition Air Force. Here is a quote from an interview with Chuck Horner. Question, did the war have any effect on the Air Force's view of the A-10? Answer. Well, the gun's an excellent weapon but you'll find that most of the tank kills by the A-10 were done with Mavericks and bombs. So, the idea that the gun is the absolute wonder of the world is not true. Question, this conflict has shown that. Answer, it shows that the gun has a lot of utility, which we always knew, but it isn't the principal tank killer on the A-10. The imaging infrared Maverick is the big hero there. That was used by the A-10s and the F-16s very, very effectively in places like Hofji. The other problem is that the A-10 is vulnerable to hits because its speed is limited. It is a function of thrust, it is not a function of anything else. We had a lot of A-10s take a lot of ground fire hits. Quite frankly, we pulled the A-10s back from going up around the Republican Guard and kept them on Iraq's less formidable frontline units. That's fine if you have a force that allows you to do that. In this case, we had F-16s to go after the Republican Guard. Another area where the A-10 is praised, its survivability. Damage resistance of a plane can be quite a relative thing. During the Desert Storm 5 A-10 AN-20 A-10 planes were lost and 13 more suffered damage. While the F-16 which was used in the same role, besides many other strike missions, lost only 3, and 4 more were damaged. The F-16s flew 13,087 sorties, while the A-10s 8,084 and 660 more the O-10s. Considering these values the sortie per loss ratio of the A-10s were three times higher than the F-16. So maybe many people can be proud that the A-10 had better damage per loss ratio but at the end of the day, regardless of how damage resistant, the A-10's specific loss was worse. It is better to not be hit at all than to be just a bit tougher. If a plane's weapon system and missile profile can ensure the first, the latter is not so important. 
Most of the damaged warthogs were hit by infrared guided manpad or anti-aircraft guns during the desert storm. The A-10 was designed to survive many of these types of hits. Regardless of the titanium bathtub around the cockpit and the twin engines, surviving the hit of a large missile was highly unlikely. So, the A-10 can resist the less advanced opponent which has only older manpads and short-range air defense guns. But against a near-peer threat where radar-guided short-range SAMs are present, the damage resistance difference between an A-10 and every other tactical plane becomes almost meaningless. Yes, the A-10 produced quite a long and spectacular kill list but during the desert storm this feat was anything but special because of the circumstances. There were lots of targets and minimal resistance following from the first week of the operation. Many planes demonstrated such killing potential as the A-10 but with better loss ratio and some could even fly at night. For example, the F-111F Aardvark with laser-guided bombs destroyed just as many tanks as the A-10 without having any type of internal gun. Besides this, it could destroy many other hardened targets like bunkers. Yes, the F-111F was a much more expensive and complex plane but it also proved that just because something is complex, it does not mean it is utterly unreliable. Another misconception about the plane that it is a real bomb and rocket truck which carries an enormous weapon payload. Yes, the A-10 has lots of hardpoints, but their role rarely has it loaded fully so it can have a more flexible weapon configuration. This approach by the way, is true for every plane. As an example, just because an F-15E can carry 7 2,000 pounds bombs it does not mean that there is reason to arm the plane with all of them. The typical loadout of the A-10s were 4 AGM-65 and 4 to 6 smaller bombs or some unguided rocket pods during Desert Storm. In addition to these, for self-defense a pair of AIM-9 Sidewinder and electronic jamming pod. Rarely 6 Maverick missiles were loaded but because of their very large drag and weight, only 2 smaller bombs or rocket pods were used. The images show the typically used weapon configurations from Desert Storm. Nowadays the upgraded A-10C variant can use other precision-guided munitions than the AGM-65s. These are the GPS-guided JDAM family, laser-guided bombs, the GBU-39 small-diameter bomb and very likely the Advanced Precision Kill Weapon System which is literally a laser-guided 2.75-inch rocket. The A-10C could carry the sniper laser targeting pod therefore it can use autonomously the laser-guided weapons. These bombs and missiles are the same as what the F-16C and F-15E planes are using in the USAF. So the capability of the A-10C is anything but unique. Except the counter-insurgency warfare and low-intensity environment it is very hard to imagine a combat situation where the Avenger would have any use. The risk of using the gun outweighs the benefits. Even against a 25-plus-year-old Russian-like integrated and layered air defense, using the gun is suicidal. The Avenger is just the heritage of the old times but it is not a good weapon for modern war. In the late 70s with low-level flight and lots of infrared decoys and support it could deal even with first-line army air defense quite well. But the arrival of the new Agla manpad and the double-digit radar-guided SAMs as the SA-15, SA-19, SA-11 or SA-17 and the longest-range SA-12 since the 90s a slow plane simply can't perform well. It can't dodge the missiles of these systems, and most of them simply outrange any weapon on the A-10C in any reasonable scenario. This is the main reason why the USAF does not wish to operate so many A-10s anymore or at all. Because in most of cases the HOG uses the same precision weapons as other supersonic planes. In coin warfare there is almost no difference between the usefulness of a 20mm M61 Vulcan and 30mm Avenger. Against soft targets both are just as lethal. So use of the Gowie is no reason to keep a large number warthogs in service, especially in the era of unmanned combat aerial vehicles. These can have even better loiter time than the A-10 and with the advanced precision kill weapon system even without an autocannon, it is possible to give very close fire. Support without risking friendly fire. The A-10C is just as a PGM platform as supersonic planes but because of its conception its flight performance and other basic characteristic limitations, it is now unsuitable to survive on a modern battlefield. The A-10 has its place in the aviation history, but times changed. The advancement in precision-guided munitions in a conventional warfare makes the A-10 a quite outdated thing. Except as a close air support platform in coin warfare the A-10 simply lost its job. If you like the video, share, subscribe and follow the channel. Further videos are coming soon not only about air defense systems but also about military operations and many other topics.